Section 13.2, pie charts and two-way tables. Pie charts. Another common way to display relative frequencies for a categorical variable is to use a pie chart. So let's go ahead and look at an example. Americans were asked which fast food chain makes the best burger, and the responses of those surveyed Americans are described by the pie chart to the right. You might notice right away my pie chart looks a little bit different than the ones you have in your notes packet. Um, they had not labeled the wedges, and I decided to do that for a couple reasons. Um, one, the lines weren't very clear to see in between, so I darkened those in. And then I printed not in color, but in black and white, so all these different grays are hard to tell apart from each other. And then it's also just a good idea in general to label your wedges. People don't like to read the fine print, so if I was doing this pie chart on my own and I was able to do it in color, I would still not put a key on the side. I would label the bars. That's more common, and I think it's better. And the percentages are over here on the side, too, but it would even be better if they were all labeled. I'm not going to label them all right here, but I'll go ahead and throw one in at 40%. In fact, I'll do one more to show another issue. A lot of times you can put the label and you can put the percentage in the wedge. If they don't both fit, like for in and out of McDonald's, it'd be hard to squeeze in that percentage. You could draw a little line off of it and say in and out is 9%. So if it gets a little crowded in the wedge, you could always label it outside of the wedge and that would be fine. All right, so there's some just issues with the way they presented the pie chart. I think it'd be better if we did it like this, labeled and filled in all the percentages. But it turns out that we could answer their questions just from what was on the side. This is just my preference. So let's go ahead and get into their questions. Find the percentage of respondents who said that five guys or in and out have the best burgers. So when we're dealing with this issue of an or, we need to know how to handle that. And ors come in kind of two varieties, an easy one and a more difficult one. The easy one is if there's no overlap between the two things. So for example, I've seen an A&W restaurant that was combined with Kentucky Fried Chicken, like it was all in the same building and you could order, right? And so if somebody said, what is that? In a way, it's both Kentucky Fried Chicken and A&W. Um, but I've never seen a five guys are in and out like that, and they're showing them a separate five guys here, in and out there, separate wedges, no overlap, no crossover. So the crossover situation that can come up looks a little bit like this, where you have like one of the restaurants here and another one here, and then maybe these would be your like KFC A and W's in the middle. So if you run into that situation, the ors get a little more complicated. We will deal with that on the next page. But in this case, where they don't have anything in common, then these ors just become additions. So what percentage of the respondents who said that five guys or in and out have the best burgers or find that percentage? We would just take the five guys percentage. So five guys is 15%. And then we would add on the percentage for in and out. And I have that labeled here and it was also labeled over there. So 24%. So fairly simple to do this as long as you understand the rule for that. So when they say or and there's no overlap, you just count up all of the first and add on all of the second. All right, let's see what their other question is. All of the restaurants included in the other category have percentages less than McDonald's. What is the minimum number of restaurants in that other category? So for example, uh, I kind of like Carl's Jr. That's not listed in here. And what they're saying is the reason it's not listed is because it was smaller than this 7% for McDonald's and they didn't want to make too many wedges, I guess. So they took all the less popular ones and they just threw them into this category of other. So what's the fewest number of restaurants that could go into there? Well, here's my theory on this. Uh, you would get the fewest number if it was a tie and they were all just below McDonald's. So let's suppose we took that 40% and divide it by 6.9. Let's say that's kind of the smallest percentage that um, they could be tied at and not have made the chart because then it'd still be smaller than the McDonald's one. And uh, that would be 5.797. Well, the number of restaurants in that category can't be 5.797. It has to be a whole number. So there's this issue of should we round that down or up? Um, we could just, I don't think we should go with the rule of like this seven's closer to or five or bigger, so round up. We should just try both and see what makes sense. Suppose there was only five restaurants in that category. Then they would have an average um, percentage of 8%, and that would mean at least one of them would be 8% or higher, and then that doesn't fit the description that it was smaller than McDonald's. What if there were six restaurants in that category? Then 40 divided by six is 
percent, and that would make sense that then now it's smaller than McDonald's, so that could be it. So I would argue that the smallest number of restaurants that could be in that other category is six. So six restaurants and other is the smallest possible value. Or the minimum, as they said it. All right, so that answers their question. And then I just wanted to pose one other, which I think is kind of strange that they didn't ask. If you're going to ask people what, uh, which fast food chain makes the best burger, I think an obvious question at the end of that is, so who won, right? Who's the most popular burger among them all? There's some temptation maybe to say other, but that doesn't make sense because that's not a restaurant. That's just a compilation of all the ones that weren't in the top, you know, so many. So you would just look for the, the biggest wedge. And let's just cover this up and say all we had is wedges. Then Five Guys, Burger King, and Wendy's all look pretty similar in size. So it's pretty important that you have those percentages listed so you can look. So it looks like the most popular burger is a tie between Burger King and Five Guys. So And then with Wendy's just short behind, right? And those are so close it's hard to tell by just looking at um, the wedges size themselves. So that's why it's nice to have this. And even better if each one had the percentage listed right in it. All right, let's move on to another topic, two-way tables. A two-way table is a table in which frequencies correspond to two, category, two categorical variables. So let's look at an example. In a survey of one of the author's statistics classes, 42 students recorded whether they were working, and a few of the results are shown in this table over here on the right. So use this information in the table to fill in all the missing frequencies needed to complete this two-way table here. So I'm going to do that by doing something called a tally mark. So what I'm going to do is just go through each of the students and put a little mark for which square they're in. So this first student is female and she was working. So if she's a working female, she goes in the female row in the working column. So she would be in this box right here. The next student is also a working female, so there's another student in the working female box. And then we have a male student who is working, so we drop down to the male row, but stay in the working column. And we just keep doing that for all of them. So another male, but he's not working, so that would go here. Another male that is working, so it would go here. Maybe a good idea to kind of check these off as we go along so we don't miss anything. And then a female student who's not working. So female, top row, not working, second column. And then we have a female student who is working, so that goes here. A male student who is working, that would be here. A female student who is not working, right there. And then another female student who is working, so she goes here. So generally when you see these charts completed, you don't see them with tally marks. So what people would do instead is just put the number. So there's four, four female working students, and then there was two female students who were not working for a total of six female students. And for the male students, there was three that were working and one that was not for a total of four male students. And that's 10 male students all together in the table, which makes sense because that's what our list said as well. And then in addition to doing these row columns, we also want to, or row totals, we want to do column totals as well. So how many working students did we have? Four female plus three male, so seven. And among those not working, two female, one male. So there's three there. And then notice the three plus seven is 10, just like the six plus four is 10. And that should always work out on your two-way tables that if you add across this way or this way, you still get the grand total of the chart. So that's just making a two-way table. We're not going to do a ton of that, but a little bit, just so we kind of understand how it's put together. When you see them in the future, you will not see these tally marks, but it's a good way to do it when you're kind of trying to just scratch it out by hand, so you're kind of making sure that everything gets put into a spot. When we turn the page, we'll start to see how we make use of two-way tables and the kind of questions they ask us about them. All right, let's go ahead and look at an example where we make use of a two-way table. So the table below compares class standings with types of body art for 490 undergraduate students surveyed at a state university in the Southwest. So we've got two variables here that the people could have been asked. One of them would be, what is your kind of standing at school, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior? So they're gonna give us that information. And then we're gonna ask them questions about, do they have any body piercings? Do they have tattoos? And then 
even though that's only kind of two things we're asking them, we're going to make that one variable kind of about, you know, types of body art that they're doing. So if they have body piercings only but no tattoos, they'll go here. If they have tattoos but no piercings, they go here. If they have some of each, they'll go here. And if they have none, they would go here. So, for example, if the first person we picked was a freshman and they had a tattoo but no piercing, they would go in this square right here. All right, so let's look at the type of questions they want us to answer. Find the proportion of those surveyed who have tattoos only. All right, so they want them to have tattoos only, so that would be in this column. And there's no mention about what grade level they're in. So if they don't mention the grade level, we want any grade level. Not meaning just randomly pick one, but take all the people who have tattoos only regardless of their grade level. So we would take the total for tattoos only, which is 44. But it asks for the proportion, so what we want to do is take that total of 44 and divide it by the number of students that were surveyed, which is 490. So the answer is 44 out of 490, which I suppose you could reduce, but typically what we do with proportions is we go to a decimal by doing the division. So 44 over 490 would be approximately 0 0.08. And then a nine, and I like to go four decimals on these proportion percentage type of things. So one, two, three, and the fourth one is a seven, but followed by a nine. So I'd round that up to an eight. And I said proportion or percentage type of thing because the way we tend to interpret a proportion is as a percentage. So this would be 8.98%. When we get these kind of questions, I think about them having kind of three phases to them. The way I think about and work out the answers with a fraction the way I would write the answer is with the decimal, and the way I would say it to somebody is with a percent. So I'd say that 8.98% of the students surveyed had tattoos only. All right, so that's a kind of basic question from the chart because it only involved one of the variables, just body art. It didn't mention grade level. Let's look at the questions now where they start bringing in both of those variables. So part B, find the proportion of those surveyed who are freshmen and have no body art. So they're freshmen and they have no body art. Okay, so how are we gonna do that one? So we need to know something about an and. So let me show you something called a Venn diagram to help us understand that a little bit. So if this is event A, and we have some other event over here called B, then the overlap or the and is the part where they cross each other or intersect. So that overlapping part right there would represent A and B. So when you see the word and, you're looking for, I like to use the word overlap. You could also say the intersection. You could also say the people have to have both. Okay, But overlap and intersection is what we're thinking of. So I marked this with this different color on purpose because now I want to use that color up here. So they said freshman. So when we come up to the chart and circle the freshman in this kind of teal color. So that's like one of my circles inside of here. And then the other thing is no body art. So no body art's this column. So we can go ahead and draw a circle around that one. And then what does and mean? It means the overlap. So where does this circle and this circle cross each other? And it's right here in this square. That's the overlap. And how many people are in there? 86. 86 out of how many? 86 out of 490. And then once we get to that point, we can do the same steps we did last time and say 86 over 490 in decimal form is 0 0.1755, which is equal to 17.55%. So new thing that we need to be on the lookout for when they say and, you're looking for the overlap of those events. All right, moving on to part C, find the proportion of those surveyed who are freshmen or have no body art. So notice that we're talking about freshmen and no body art here, and now we're switching it to freshmen or no body art. So same two kind of events, if you will, but this time an or instead of an and, so we need to see what the difference is. And we did ors on the previous page, and there I said that was a simple case where we just add all of the first to all of the second, but I said that was because they didn't have anything in common. And here, if we look at the table, we see there's 86 students who are freshmen and fall into the category of no body art. So those 86 people are in both of these categories. And when you have that happening, that can make ORs a little bit trickier. 
So we'll start off doing the Venn diagram. I'll just go ahead and use the same color because we've already marked the freshman and the no body art up there in this color. And then I'll list the two circles again. So we have the A and the B, but this time we're looking at the idea of an OR. And for an OR, you count everything that's in the first one and then only the new stuff in the second one. So what's happening there is you're being careful not to double count. So you want everybody who's in at least one of these circles. It can be in just this one, it can be in just that one, or it can be both, but you don't want to double count. So a few things we could write in words. We want at least one, and so count all the things that fall into at least one of the circles. And then the way that I like to think of it is all of the first. but only the new from the second. And what we're trying to be careful of is don't double count. All right, so how are we gonna do that? Well, if we did these words, all of the first, but only new stuff from the second, then the first thing that's listed there are the freshmen. So all of the freshmen would be the total, which is 168. And then we'd say, now let's move on to those that have no body art, but don't count all 247 of them because then you'd be double counting these 86, but only add the new stuff from the second one, which would be the sophomores, juniors, and seniors with no body art. So we need to add on the 64 sophomores, the 43 juniors, and the 54 seniors who have no body art. So that represents all of the first, and then only the new ones from the second, and then because they want it to be a proportion, I'm going to divide that by the grand total. So 490, and then I can go ahead and go to the calculator. And it's worth noting that it looks a little different on the calculator than what it looks like on paper. If I put it in just like this, then um, so here, let's just do it, 168 plus 64 plus 43 plus 54 over 490, like that. Then the order of operations on the calculator would be add these, then divide, then add. So we're going to get a number that doesn't make sense for a proportion. What's being divided by 490 in this fraction is everything. So it really should look like this. Parentheses around the entire numerator, and then divide. And then we get an answer that makes sense for proportion, something between 0 and 1. So 0 0.6714 or 67.14%. All right, so there's a good comparison between the AND and the OR case. So with AND, you're just taking the overlap, and then with the OR, you're taking all of the first and whatever's new from the second. Notice that does include the overlap. So an answer to, if you have this situation where it's the same topics both time, freshman, no body art, freshman, no body art, the answer to the OR will always be bigger or the same size as this one. Same size would be kind of a weird situation, but could happen. But you get bigger answers for ORs than you do for ANDs in this situation. So the AND shrinks down to the overlap. The OR takes all of the first, everything new from the second. The most common mistake with these, to be honest with you, is to mix them up. So you want to be careful with that. All right, moving on to part D. Find the proportion of sophomores surveyed who have both body piercings and tattoos. So we have something a little different going on this time. Instead of saying the proportion of those surveyed, which they said before, so that was out of the whole table, 490 people, now they're saying find the proportion of sophomores. So we're just looking at the sophomores for this question. So that tells me a couple things. I'm not really going to consider the whole table when I answer this. I'm only going to consider this row that has the sophomores in it. Nothing I do on this question is going to go outside of that row. And that means when I do the division at the end, part, like I always do to make it a proportion, I wouldn't divide by 490 the whole table because they're only saying of the sophomores, so I would only divide by the 128 sophomores. All right, so now if we're only looking at those 128, who do we want in the numerator of this? We want the ones who have both body piercings and tattoos. So if we stick with the purple row only, then how many people have both body piercings and tattoos? There's 54 people in that column, but we're only supposed to look at the sophomores, so there's 10 sophomores that fall into that category. So it's 10 out of 128. And we can bring in the calculator. 10 over 128 is approximately 0 0.0781 or 
0.81% when I move the decimal over a couple spots to change to a percentage. So that's worth a quick note down on the bottom. When they use a phrase like of sophomores, you would only use numbers from the indicated row or column, in that case it was the sophomore row, when you calculate the proportion. Otherwise, the denominator would be the grand total for the whole table. So, in general, somebody starts asking about proportion, you kind of figure you're going to divide by the 490, the grand total. But if they use a phrase like of the sophomores, then you restrict your view to just that smaller part. And they're going to do that again for us with this next one. Find the proportion of juniors, so there's that phrase, right, of juniors, who have both body piercings and tattoos. So I'll bring in another color for that. We're only going to look at the row for juniors this time. So I'll circle that in green. And if we're only looking at the juniors, it means we're only looking at 79 people. So that would be my denominator. And then it's the same question. Uh, they have both body piercings and tattoos. So we look at the both body piercing and tattoos column. But again, we don't use the 54 because they're only saying of juniors. So if you restrict your view to the juniors, then there are seven of those. So seven of the 79 juniors have both body piercings and tattoos. And we can do the calculator a bit again. So 7 out of 79 is 0 0.0886. Slide the decimal over a couple spots to make it a percentage, so 8.86%. All right, let's have a look at the final question. A student says that the surveyed sophomores are more likely than surveyed juniors to have both body piercing and tattoos because there were more sophomores, 10 of them right there, who have both than juniors where there was only seven. So what would you tell the student? Well, what I would tell them is a phrase like more likely is not about how many, right? When What they're saying is there's more students that have that, but more likely is about proportion. Uh, officially, it's about probability but we use these proportions to do probabilities. You'll see that in later chapters. So when somebody uses the phrase like more likely, you don't want to compare the count 10 to seven, you want to compare the proportion. So 8.86% of the juniors have both body piercing and tattoos, but it was only 7.81% for the sophomores. So it's actually more likely for the juniors. So now we have to put that in writing. I guess the first thing we tell them is they're wrong, right? But we'd, we'd be tactful about it. So more likely is about probability or proportion. Not count. So when somebody says which is more likely, you don't say what is there more of. You look at which one has the higher proportion. And so juniors have the higher proportion. And therefore are more likely. I guess the other thing that's worth throwing in there too, um, I guess this is just about the surveyed sophomores, but um, we wouldn't want to generalize this completely about sophomores and juniors because it's fairly close and um, this is just a sample of surveyed people. But of, among those surveyed, it's more likely that a junior would have both piercings and tattoos because they have the higher proportion. And again, more likely is about the proportion, not about the count. All right, that wraps up section 13.2.